Uh, we, what we do is we have outdoor activities, and then we have 50 people in here. We have, we have an out, outdoor activities, we have indoor activities, we have, uh, we have craft activities, and so we rotate people throughout so that we're doing all the social distancing thing, uh, and uh, we're, like, everybody's keeping safe, and uh, we're going to do that. So we sort of had a run-through this past Wednesday. This Wednesday, uh, uh, the, um, we will be having... A, a, uh, Camp Liberty here, and so I would encourage you to come and get set up. If you have questions about that, you can contact Pastor Neil. Pastor Neil, are you in here? Pastor Neil, he's out running everything, so uh, uh, you can get in touch with him. And then Sunday or Wednesday evening, we're going to be having our youth group. The youth group is back. They're going to be meeting in here, so after all of the, uh, the five through 12-year-olds are are out. Then in the afternoon, we'll do all the sanitizing that we need to do. And then in the evening, we're going to have a teen group here. And uh, so we would encourage you to do that. This afternoon at 4 o'clock, from 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock, you can support our teen group by buying your fireworks. If you're planning on buying fireworks for the 4th of July, we would encourage you to get those fireworks uh, here. Uh, you get 10% off because you're a member of Liberty Baptist Church. Plus, you don't have to pay tax uh, when you buy uh, here at Liberty Baptist Church. And so I would encourage you to do that. And what we do with that money is we use that money to help kids get to, to summer camp uh, this year. And so we would encourage you to, to participate with that. And that's right in the parking lot of the church. You can get, up, get involved with that. And then Saturday, this coming Saturday, we have our 4th of July picnic. We want to encourage you to come uh, to that. That's from 8 o'clock till uh, till 5 o'clock at night. It's at uh, the Foxtail Campground up in Lee Canyon. To get there, all you have to do is drive out 95 until you see a sign that's about, it's a sign uh, that you can, you can just get out at, uh, uh, it'll say Lee Canyon. You see that? You turn left uh, and just go until you see Foxtail Canyon and, and Foxtail Campground and you'll go left. It's very hard to miss. Uh, I've missed it a couple of times, but most people, it's very hard to miss. You'll, be, you'll see it. And it, it, I'm telling you, it's, it's going to be 110 degrees here. It will be somewhere between 70 and 80 degrees up there. They have things up there called trees, and you're going to really enjoy them. And uh, so there's, uh, it's a wonderful place to be, and it'll be a great time of fellowship. We have four pavilions uh, that will handle 48 people per, per pavilion, and uh, then there's... All, there's great big area. Uh, we would en en encourage you to come and be part of that. That will be a great, great time together. I think I've made all the announcements I need to make. Pastor Matt is in Pensacola, Florida this week. He is doing a camp uh, for Pensacola Christian College uh, this week, and then next week he'll be on vacation with his family. So pray for them as they're gone. That's why I'm making announcements. We're going to sing a couple more songs, and then uh, we're going to get right into the message. Okay, let's stand again as we sing Because He Lives, Because He Lives. Because He Lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He Lives, all fear is gone. Because I know He holds a future and life is worth a living just because he lives. 
aren't you glad that you know that he lives? And because of that, we don't have to worry about tomorrow. We don't have to worry about any fear. Do you say amen to that? Because of that, why don't we just lift up our voices to the Lord and let him know how much we love him as we sing, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. voices. Our God is wonderful. Can you say amen to that? Take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Today we are continuing our series. Yes, last week we started a series entitled The War Against God. Today I want to talk about winning the war through discipleship. Winning the war through discipleship. And I want, you, I want to make this point, and I want you to really grab this. Today, I am not talking to the person that's sitting there, right here, because there's nobody sitting here. And today, I'm not talking to your wife. I'm talking to you. And, and lady, I'm not talking to your husband. Today, I'm talking to you. And Sam, I'm not talking to your brother today. I'm talking to you. This message isn't for him, it's for you. Bryce, this message isn't for him, it's for you. And I want you to keep that in mind. God wants us, I'm staying six feet away, but, I, but, but uh, Rob, this is especially for you. you need, I want you to take this message and take it personally. From time to time, somebody will come up and say, preacher, man, I heard that message. It was like right for me. I want you to understand today this message is for you. This is from God to us, and God wants us to see this. I want you, this, this is taking place, this whole thing is taking place right after Saul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. Saul, the enemy of God. Saul, the enemy of Christians. Saul, the terrorist. Saul, the murderer. Saul, the one who is imprisoning people. He's the persecutor. He's the one that called himself injurious. He's the one who consented unto the death of Christians. He is a horrible, horrible man. He's heading to Damascus, and God, God is in. Uh, God appears to him. The Lord Jesus appears to him and says, "Why are you persecuting me?" And we talked about this last week. That that uh, when you are attacking other Christians, when people are attacking Christians, Jesus takes that personally. He didn't say, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? He said, why are you persecuting me? We need to understand that it's very, we need to be very careful about talking negatively about other Christians because when we do, we are attacking him. It doesn't mean we can't see wrong. It doesn't mean we can't have the ability to judge right and wrong. It does mean that we need to be very careful about what we say. 
because the Christians are members of the family of God. We're part of the kingdom of God. Every local church is a representative of the kingdom of God, and we need to be careful. And we need to understand also that we don't have to take vengeance for ourselves because God is aware of our lives. And we, he considers himself one with us. So if we're being attacked, he's being attacked. And so we can leave the vengeance, we can leave the revenge to God. He can take care of those things. What we need to do is remember that Jesus is the judge and we are supposed to be out representing him. We are not to do his work our, our responsibility is to reach lost people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Saul is on his way. Jesus approaches him and says, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you? He says, I am the Lord who you're persecuting. It's hard for you to fight against me. And he says, listen, what you're going to do is you, he, Saul said, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to go to Damascus and wait. Three days go by. Saul is in utter darkness. He is blind. He cannot see. He does not eat, so he's hungry. He's thirsty. While all of this is going on with Saul, Saul has a vision. He, vi he visualizes by God gave him the vision of a man named Ananias who's going to come at some point, and God doesn't tell him what point. He's going to lay hands on him, and he's going to be healed. And he's going to be able to see. That's all Saul knows. Here he is in darkness. Here he is hungry. Here he is thirsty. He is the murderer. He is the terrorist. He's a terrible guy. And he's in darkness. Now the Bible t t takes us to the other side of the story. The Bible says in verse 10, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus, named Ananias. And I want you to underline the words, a certain disciple. I want you to see that he doesn't say there was a pastor in, in this place. Boy, where did you guys come from? Is that the, like a reverse rapture? <laughs> I mean, I didn't see you come in. I mean, a boom, you're there. And like, you, you went and came back and, well, man, all right. Whew, man. It's a miracle right here. You saw it. I didn't, but you saw it. He got here. He, was, he doesn't say he was the pastor of the church of Damascus. He may have been, but he doesn't say that. It doesn't say that he, and remember, this is a brand new church anyway, because they're in Damascus because they've run from Jerusalem. Uh, some ran to Samaria. We talked about Philip the last couple of weeks. And then and, and there was a group that ran to Damascus. They are in Damascus. They're meeting together. There's a church there. But the Bible doesn't say about Ananias. The Bible doesn't say, in fact, except for this story and Paul telling this story again in Acts chapter 22, the Anani we know nothing about Ananias. All we know is that he was a certain disciple. It doesn't say he was a deacon. It doesn't say he was a pastor. It doesn't say he was a leader. It doesn't say anything about him. It just says he was a certain disciple. A disciple is somebody who learns, somebody who's learned the things of God and, and following Jesus. A disciple primarily is a learner, and we need to understand that. So he says here, he says, there was a certain disciple. Remember that. That's you and me. So you're a certain disciple. You got saved, and he, he saved you. And, and now you're a disciple. He was at Damascus, a certain disciple at Damascus, named Ananias. To him, the Lord said in a vision, so Ananias is most likely praying, talking to God. He's in a vision, the Bible says in a vision, the Lord said to him, Ananias, and he said, behold, I am here. That is, I'm, the idea of I am here is I am ready. I'm, I'm ready to do what you want me to do. I'm ready to obey you. I am, I am here, Lord, Master, whatever it is that you have for me. And the Lord said unto him, arise. Now, we say to God, God, I'm willing to do anything you want me to do. But man, sometimes he'll give you an assignment that doesn't seem too pleasant. Maybe he'll tell you to do something. You say, wait a minute. Ananias is saying, I'm your disciple. I'm ready to do whatever it is you want me to do. And God says, good, here's what I want you to do. The Lord said unto him, arise and go unto the street, which is called straight. I want to show you a picture of that street. 
See that? That's in Damascus. That is the straight street. The reason they call that the straight street is because it's straight. <laughs> See that? That is really, that's the street. And so on one side of that street, we don't know exactly where, but on one end of that street, there's a guy named Ananias. On the other end of that street, there's a, 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 a man who lives, he's got a house, his name is Judas. And in Judas's house, this is not Judas Iscariot, it's another Judas, that was a very common name back then. So uh, Judas is on the other side, uh, at the end of that street, and, and uh, Ananias is on the other side of the street, and God says, listen, I got something for you to do. And so here is God's instruction to him. He says, arise and go into the street, which is called straight. This is, so, this is not difficult. This is easy. And inquire at the house of Judas. Go down to Straight Street and look for Judas's house. For, and that's no problem. Up to this point, everything's okay. Okay, I can go see Judas. For one called Saul of Tarsus. Now we have a problem. Go see Saul of Tarsus. Behold, he's praying. Don't worry, he's praying. He's talking to me. Well, well uh, the Bible says, and he hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias. Oh no, God, why would you do that? Why would you show him me? Why would you point me out to him? He's a murderer. He's a, he's a person that hates Christians. You're going to go there. He's had a vision of you coming in and putting his, his hands on him that he might receive his sight. So Saul is there and he already has a vision of, of Ananias coming and laying hands on him. And the Bible says, and Ananias answered and said, Lord, this is what I would do. This is exactly what I would be doing. The Bible says that Ananias, or I might have been like Jonas and said, no, I'm going someplace else. Uh, there's another direction for me to go. But the Bible says, and Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man that he, the, uh, how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. Your saints at Jerusalem that you know what he did? Uh, he's imprisoning them. You remember Stephen getting stoned? Uh, can I tell you a few more stories? I just want you to be aware of what you're asking me to do. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Hey, do you realize he's here to get me? That's he's everybody, and, and that includes me. The Bible says this, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way. Can I tell you this? This is a very important statement. God has a way for you to go. God has a plan for your life. He didn't say go my way. He didn't say go uh, your sister's way or your brother's way. He said go, my, go thy way. Go thy way. For he is a chosen vessel unto me. I have a way for you, and my way is for you to reach a chosen vessel, to bear my name before the Gentiles. This is very interesting. Gentiles. See, if you're not, if you don't have a Jewish background, anybody in here Jewish in any, any kind of Jewish background? Okay. So you're all Gentiles. What is happening in this story affected you? Because you're a Gentile. And Paul. Saul, who is the wicked terrorist, is going to become the apostle Paul, and he's going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. So he says to Ananias, Ananias, I am going to use you to reach a guy that's going to go out and reach all of the Gentiles. Because of what Ananias did, humanly speaking, you're saved today. This is a very important passage. You're saved because Ananias went, obeyed God, went to a guy who was a terrorist, and, and told him uh, what to do. I love the way God uses people. He says, the Bible says, he's, he's going he's to be a witness before uh, the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For, he says in verse 16, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. People will take that verse and say, listen, if we're going to be Christians and all of us are going to suffer the way Saul did. No. The Bible says this, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
Saul was a terrorist. He persecuted. And the principle of sowing and reaping uh, applies to us. If I've done things wrong before I was saved, there's still going to be some physical reaping after I get saved. Doesn't mean this passage does not mean that every Christian is going to suffer all that Saul suffered, as the Apostle Paul. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And now this is the amazing thing. Okay, so he just told him, You're gonna go see this guy. I've chosen you to do this. You're gonna go him because I you're gonna go touch him because I've chose you to do this. And the Bible says, and Ananias went his way. He did what he was supposed to do. And he entered into the house and putting his hand on him. So there's no social distancing here, you see. Uh, the Bible says, putting his hands on him, he said, brother, he didn't refer to him as you terrorist, you wicked vile, you thing, you persecutor of Christians, you, you nasty, nasty man. He didn't say that. The Bible says he went up, put his hands on him, and he said, brother, Wow, brother, brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, hath appeared unto thee in the way that thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight. Listen, I, can I tell you this? Ananias' brother may have been persecuted by him. Ananias' brother, may, a wife, may have been taken away. Ananias' friends may have been hurt because of him. Ananias approaches him and says, Brother Saul, I'm here that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. You're my brother. And the Bible says when he did that, when he did what God told him to do, immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. He goes in there to this guy who was a terrorist who is now blind and he is hungry and he is thirsty and he has no direction. And God uses him to feed him, to give him drink, to open his blinded eyes and to give him direction and introduce him to a local church, and he gets baptized. Wow, what a story, what a story. Father, I pray that you help us to learn some things from this story that'll help us as Christians understand what disciples do. And Father, I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. How do we as Christians win the war that is being fought against God? Here's the answer, through discipleship. Through discipleship. God wants us to understand that, there is, that his methods are not our methods. His ways are far above our ways. It's a whole lot better to see somebody converted than it is to chop off their head and fight against them. The Bible tells us very simply that God wants us to make disciples. Jesus said to his, Jesus said to his disciples, "'Go ye therefore and teach all nations.'" That is, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. That is God's plan for us. When we look at people, we should not look at them as enemies. Even if they say unkind things about us, even if they do unkind things towards Christians, we need to understand that God is able to save anyone. So I want you to see six things that we learn from here. Number one, I want you to see, number one, that God uses disciples. I want you to see again in verse 10 that he says there was a certain disciple. A disciple is somebody who is willing to learn. And Ananias had a lot to learn right now, right now, as he's praying, I got something to teach you. And what I'm going to teach you right now is, is this. He is not a pastor. He is not a deacon. He's not a great teacher. He's not ju he is just a disciple. He had to be a learner. He had to be somebody who was willing to be taught by Jesus. And what he's taught here primarily is this, that anybody can get saved. Yes, Saul of Tarsus can get saved. Yes, this wicked terrorist can get saved. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever, anybody that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's an amazing statement. 
The world does not believe in conversion, but you and I believe in conversion. We look at people and we say, look at that, that person's an enemy of Christianity. Let me ask you a question, when was the last time you prayed for that enemy? Pray for that enemy. Um, there are people who say, hey, that, that person could never get saved. That, that, you, that, that, that person's beyond help. There was a guy that came to our church for years and uh, he, he would always say, pray for my dad to get saved. His dad came in, sat right where you were sitting one day. He came in, he was 90 years old. And I preached a message. I told people how to get saved. He got up, came forward, went back in that back room to talk to somebody about getting saved. He said, my, my dad's never going to get saved. He walked back there and I said, well, look, at God's going to save him. Walked back to back, that back room. Pastor Matt talked to him about getting saved. And he said, nope, I, I'm not going to do that. And he walked out not saved. And he said, this, that's it. That will never happen. I said, I'm going to keep praying for your dad. His name was Ira. I'm going to pray for your dad to get saved. I'm going to pray for your dad to get saved. He said, I, I've given up. It's just not going to happen. Six years later, 96 years old, Dan calls me up and he says, i got to tell you something. My dad just trusted Christ as his Savior. <laughs> wow. I mean, he wanted nothing. And you're 90 years old, you think that's your last chance. God kept him hanging on six more years. Six more years, the guy gets saved, and it was within that next year he, trust, he, he went to heaven. Listen, God isn't finished with anyone. What we need to do is understand that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what that means? That Saul of Tarsus, the enemy of the cross, could get saved. You know what that means? That that politician who you don't like can get saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Nancy Pelosi, uh, Governor Sisolak, now for you other, others, Donald Trump. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now listen, back when George W. Bush was running for office, he was running for office, and I, I remember him being interviewed out in a garden situation with several different candidates. And they asked the question, they said, who uh, is the most influential figure in all of history who's influenced you? Who would be your hero? And they asked all these different candidates, and they talked about this person and that person. They got to George W. Bush, and he said, well, my hero would be Jesus Christ, the, my Lord. And I thought, oh, wait, wait. And I didn't have it on tape. I would have rewound it and listened to that over and over again. I said, where did that come from? Man, I, I, and then I started watching him, and then I started reading about how he had trusted Christ as Savior. And I thought, this is great. So I, I, man, this, is, this guy's got my vote. I mean, the guy just blatantly in front of everybody said, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and he's my hero. And uh, man, he's the greatest influence ever in history. What an amazing thing, I thought. Then October came along, Right before the elections, it was like six weeks before, not even six weeks, three weeks before the election. And, and I, I was up in a hotel room with my wife and with Matthew, and the news came on that night. Well, it's been discovered that George W. Bush had a, a, a DUI 13 years ago and that he uh, got involved in Alcoholics Unanimous, and that he, was, he, was, uh, he, is a, he is an alcoholic and admitted alcoholic. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? 13 years before, and I looked at my wife, and I said, you know what? The world doesn't believe in conversion. The world does not believe that a person can change. The world doesn't believe that, that, that you can actually be going down one path, meet Jesus Christ, and turn around. But you and I as believers believe that. Say amen to that. We believe in conversion. We believe that people can change their life. So hey, listen, you can go into anybody's back life and pull up all sorts of garbage about anybody's back life. But when you get saved, God changes you. God changes you. Saul was a horrible man. Nobody believed that that guy could get saved. But there was one guy at least 
named Ananias who was in Damascus and scared to death, this guy's coming to kill us. I don't want it. And God said, okay, here, I don't want him to kill you either, so here's what I want you to do. You go talk to him about me. Thank you, but can I have a different assignment? I want you to understand that God uses disciples. And that means we have to learn. He had to learn from Jesus, hey, anybody can get saved, and I've saved Saul, and you're going to help him. Some people have a hard time accepting new truth. They really do, because uh, it's difficult. I mean, we, we have traditions. We have things that we are brought up with, and we say, this has got to be the way that it is. And then the truth of the Word of God comes along and challenges old tradition. And we say, wait a minute, we have a problem. Wait a, wait a, minute, wait a minute, I have a problem. He was a disciple. He was a learner. In order to be a disciple, listen, you've got to be willing to learn from the Bible and hear what God says. So God, the first point is that God uses disciples and God wants to use you. Number two, I want you to see this, that disciples are given assignments. Disciples are given assignments. He has been given an assignment and it's not a pleasant assignment. God gave Ananias an assignment to go to witness. And I want you to see, he did not get to choose his assignment. The Bible says, and the Lord said unto him, arise. He didn't say, ah, Ananias, I got a question. Would you be willing to do something for me? No, that's not what he did. He didn't say, um, Ananias, I'm, uh, what would you like to be doing this afternoon? He didn't say that. He said, this is what I want you to do. Arise, it's a command. Go into the street, which is called straight. It's very simple, this is a straight street. And inquire at the house of Judah for one called Saul of Tarsus, for he prayeth. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias. This is you, this is your assignment, this is what you're going to do. He was seeking God's direction and God gave him an assignment. When I first got saved, I remember asking God to use me. I, I wanted to be used of God, and I wanted to be used of God to come back to Las Vegas and start a Christian school and start a, a church. And I remember going to Bible college, and when I got to Bible college, I was there, and I'm studying, and I'm thinking, man, I'm so far away from Vegas, and I can't do what I want to do, but I knew God wanted me there, and so I'm there, and I'm thinking, I want to get back to Vegas. I want to get back to Vegas. I want to get back to Vegas. And by my junior year, I thought, this is it. This is a way too long. My whole life, Jesus is probably coming back in the next six months, and I'm here in college studying. I want to get out of here. I want to go do what God wants me to do. God, you, and I'm having this conversation with God one night in my dorm. Now, our dorms were different. These, this was not a fancy place at all. This was a, these were old army barracks that had been transported to this island out in the middle of the James River, and there were like 24 bunks in, which meant 48 guys in a room smaller than this. And we had like two showers, that was it. So, and uh, this was the place. And uh, I'm, I'm there in my little cubby hole under, in my bottom bunk uh, with towels around the bunk so I could have some privacy. And I'm, and, I'm, and I'm talking to the Lord and I'm saying, Lord, I want to get back to Vegas. I want to disciple people. Now, I'm a junior in college at that time. In that room, there was at least 40 other guys. Most of them were freshmen that looked up to a junior that had been there in college. And as I'm there praying, saying, God, I need to go back to Las Vegas. I really need to get back to Las Vegas. The Spirit of God, I, I want to be discipling. I want to be reaching people. And the Spirit of God said to me, look around you, David. Look at what is around you. There's all sorts of underclassmen that would love to be a friend with a junior who would just help them grow in Jesus Christ. It's important that we understand that God gives us assignments, and he doesn't give us assignments that are across the world necessarily. He may call you to go to Bolivia, wherever that is. Uh, he may call you to go to Australia. He may call you to go to Fiji. He may call you somewhere, 
But I want you to understand, he has an assignment for you here right now. God said, look, I don't want you, he didn't say, I, do, you need to, do you need to leave what you're doing, go out into the desert of Gaza, there's an Ethiopian. No, Philip took care of that. He didn't say, you need to travel from here and go to Samaria. No, Philip took care of that. He didn't say, I need you to go all the other side of the world. He said, no, right here, a certain disciple, you, a certain disciple, are right here and right down the street, straight street, there's somebody that needs you right now. He's lost, he's blind, he's hungry, and he's thirsty, and he needs someone to care for him, and he needs you right now. Get out of your comfort zone and go down to where he is, because it's certainly going to be uncomfortable for you when you go down there. You see, we need to open our eyes and look around us. Jesus was in Samaria. He had just won a lady to the Lord who was, uh, who was uh, an immoral lady. She just gets saved. She goes back into town to get a bunch of people uh, to tell them about, about the Messiah. His disciples come to, come to him and they say to him, what are you doing? Here's some food. He says, I've got meat to eat that you know not of. And he says to them, look, he, he, he makes this statement. Put it up there. He says, say not ye, there are yet four months. At this point, when, the, when he's saying these words, people from Samaria are coming out to the well to hear, to see this Jesus. So he, he, he points at them and he says, yet don't say to yourself, yet there's four months and then cometh harvest. He says, behold, lift up your eyes. And he points at these Samaritans, who the Jewish people hated. Uh, he says, behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. They're ready right now. You see, there are people in your neighborhood, there are people where you work, there are people, uh, there are people that you're gonna bump into tomorrow, there are gonna, there's people everywhere, all around us. When we walk out those doors, when we go anywhere we are, the, the fields are white already to harvest. You, all you have to do is go to Straight Street. Just go right down the street. I've got an assignment for you. My question for you today is this, and this is what I want to really ask you to do. Ask yourself, God, what's my assignment? Who is it that you want me to reach? Who is it that I should be giving a gospel track to this week? Who is it that I'm supposed to get to you this week? Right here, right now, in this place. What's my assignment? Open your eyes. See the fields. What does God want you to be doing? Who is it that God wants you to be reaching right now, right now? Ask God. Now, let me tell you this. In your priorities, husbands, God has given you a wife to disciple. Then love your wife. Parents, God has given you children to disciple. Mom, dad, disciple those children. You're in a neighborhood, you've got, you've got friends and family. Who is it that God wants you to disciple? All you have to do is ask God. Here's Ananias praying. You may not like the answer. He may say, that one, and you say, no, let's look at somebody else. He may say, Saul of Tarsus, and you say, no, he's a terrorist. Who is it? But there's an assignment. Number one, God uses disciples. Number two, God gives disciples assignments. Number three, disciples know how to pray. In verses three, 13 through 16, the Bible says, And Ananias answered, Lord, I have, I have heard many of, of this man, how, how, how much evil he hath done to all the saints that are in Jerusalem. Here he hath authority. Uh, so he knows how to pray. God, I'm going to need you, and I'm going to need your help. Disciples know how to pray. Can I tell you this? Prayer is asking. But it's not just asking. It's asking according to the will of God. It's asking. Prayer is more than just asking for things. It's not just, my name's Jimmy, 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 gimme, gimme, gimme. It's not all about that. It's asking God for things that will advance his kingdom. In Luke chapter 11, the Bible says, and he said unto them, 
When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let your name be holy in my life. Let your kingdom come in my life. Let your will be done in my life as in heaven, so in earth. Give us this day everything we need to do your will. So prayer is asking, but it's more than just asking for things. It's, it's beseeching God for his will and his direction. And that's what Ananias was doing. It's asking God to allow you to be effective in reaching people with the gospel. It begins with a strong desire for his will to be known, for his holy name to be manifest in your life. It's pleading with God for the advancement of his kingdom. And when we get his direction, then we converse with him about that. Well, God, how am I supposed to do that? God, if this is what you want me to do, how is that going to happen? Ananias knew what God wanted him to do, and he expressed concerns with what God was directing him to do, and the Spirit guided his life. Can I ask you a question? Do you have prayer? Do you have fellowship with God? Is there a time every day that you're alone with God saying, God, you know the situation we're in? You know what's going on with the world. You know what's going on with the pandemic. You know what's going on with my job. You know what's going on. Do you get down before God and just lay it out? God, here's my family situation. Here's my situation. God, I need your direction. I am here just to do your will. I'm here to follow your direction. I'm here for for you to work. Lord, give me everything I need to do your will. When you get open and honest with God, he'll give you direction and your prayer time will be conversational. You'll be hearing his direction. Disciples have assignments from God. God uses disciples. They have assignments from God and they know how to pray and say, God, what do you want me to do about this thing? I want you to see number four, that disciples obey God. They obey God. I think the most amazing thing about this is God told Ananias to go see a guy who he was afraid of, who who frightened him. And Ananias said, okay. Verse 17 says, and Ananias went his way. God said, I want you to go thy way. And so the Bible says, and Ananias went his way. And he enters into the house and he puts his hands on him. Wow, that's an amazing thing. I want you to see disciples obey God. This was a tough assignment, but once he got clarification, he did not have to travel around the world. He did not have to make a public spectacle. It wasn't some big thing that he was going to do, uh, except that it changed the world. God didn't give him some assignment that would say, oh, Ananias' name's going to be in lights next week. Look, he witnessed to Saul. We're still talking, everybody talks about the Apostle Paul. Very few people even know about Ananias. But he changed the world. The Bible says this, and Jesus said this, and why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Jesus asked that simple question. Why do you call me Lord? Why do you call me Master, and you don't listen to me? Disciples obey God. When he went to him, he spoke not his words, but he spoke God's words to him. He said, he said, uh, the Bible says that Ananias went his way, and he entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, he said, A Lord, the Lord, even Jesus, hath appe- that hath appeared unto thee. He begins to talk to him about the Jesus. So disciples get assignments. And then disciples obey what God tells them to do. Number five, disciples recognize other Christians as brothers. I love this. He walked into him and he did not say to him, you vile thing, just be happy that God even cares about you. You blind, uh, you blind, hungry. Uh, He didn't say any of that. He walked in and he said, brother Saul. Disciples recognize other Christians as brothers. We really, really have to make sure that we understand that other Christians that don't believe exactly the way we believe are still our brothers and sisters in Christ. Satan wins a lot of battles because Christians are fighting other Christians. That ought never be the case for you and me. 
the next time that Satan puts it in your mind to say something negative about a brother or sister in Christ, but you don't know what they said and you don't know what they did and they even said something bad about you, preacher. Can you want to know what they said bad about you? No, I know enough bad about me. If somebody says something bad about me to you, don't repeat it to me. It depresses me. And, and I, don't, I don't want to hear the bad. I mean, I already know the bad. I'm, I'm reminded all the time. I look in the mirror and I say, yeah, that's bad. But uh, God redeems the bad. He walks in and puts his hand and said, Brother Saul. First Timothy says, in first five, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 says, Rebuke not an elder, that is an older brother, but entreat him as a father. And this is the way it's supposed to be within the local church. But entreat him as a father, and the younger as brethren, and the elder women as mothers, and younger, the younger as sisters, with all purity. We're to treat older people like fathers. Where is Pastor Shore? <laughs> the father figure. Somebody said, how much older is he than you the other day? I said, frankly, I'm about, actually about 10 years older than him, but he looks so much older. The Bible says, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. He's not here. So he deserves this because he's not here. <laughs> rebuke him. The Bible tells us we're to treat each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't fight our brothers. We encourage them. We don't criticize new believers. We lift them up. Well, if he was really a Christian, he would never do that. What did you do as a baby Christian? Oh, dear, he said this, and he said, don't criticize your brothers. Somebody calls himself a brother and says they believe in Jesus, and they love, then help him, encourage him, lift him up. That's the way it's supposed to be. Well, he, he, should, he should, some of the things he says, listen, don't chime in when everybody's ripping on some well-known Christian. Yeah, I knew he died. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, he can't. Look at him. No, just this is what we do. Love him as a father or a brother, her as a mother or a sister. Disciples treat other disciples like brothers and sisters in Christ. And then lastly, disciples train other disciples. Look at verse 18 and 19. It says, and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and rose and was baptized. I want you to see all that, that Saul did here. First of all, or that Ananias does, he goes to a home. He goes to his home and he, at, to, to where he is. He endangers himself to go to this guy's home. Now, uh, he goes to Judas' home and he, to, to, to meet Saul. Then the Bible says he put hands on him. Uh, he, there is, again, no social distancing here. He puts his hands on him. He's like personally involved. He's rubbing up against Saul. They're getting, they're, they're having, uh, th th he's going to develop a relationship with this guy. He got personally involved. See, we can't be the, we can't be the people that say, oh, I'm not getting involved in that. No, I'm not getting involved in that. No, I'm not getting involved in that. Oh, man, I'm too busy. I'm not doing that. Well, I already got enough friends. I don't need any more friends. You may have all the friends you need, but there's somebody who needs you as a friend. Oh, you may have it all together, but there's a lot of people that don't have it all together. And I want you to know, Saul was going to be a pain to Ananias. Do you understand? This guy's, first of all, he's mean. And people don't change overnight. They get saved. The Spirit of God comes in and lives inside. But this guy's a mean guy. So he's going to have to deal with that. Besides the fact this guy's blind. This guy hasn't eaten for three days. And he, and he hasn't drunk anything for three days. So he's going to need physical taking care of. He's going to need spiritual taking care of. And the Bible says he does all that. Ananias, listen, not a preacher, not the pastor, not, not the deacon, not some titled guy. Just a disciple. Just you, just me. Go take care of this guy. Make sure he's, and the Bible tells us, make sure he's fed. He makes sure he gets something to drink. He, sees, he t tells him uh, what he needs to do. He, he, the guy gets his sight back. Then he takes him to his home and he introduces him to the church. He gets baptized and becomes a member of that church and he gets him into that church. 
Wow. This is an amazing man, Ananias. That's an amazing man. Is there are books written about him? No, he was just a certain disciple. He was just Kyle like you and me. Jason, he's just like you and me. He's the disciple that God wants to use, just like he wants to use you, Mingo, and he wants to use me. Diane, just like he wants to use you, and he wants to use me. God uses disciples. He uses disciples to train other disciples, but we gotta be obedient. We gotta be people of prayer. There are people all around us that don't know this. They don't know that Jesus is God. They don't know that Jesus loves them so much that he came to die and pay the penalty of their sins, that he was buried, and three days later he rose from the dead, and that they as sinners, all they have to do is call on Jesus and say, Jesus, save me, and they can have eternal life. They don't know that. And there are people around us that are new Christians, and they don't know how to live for Christ. And that's where we come in as disciple makers. As disciples, we are to make other disciples, tell them how to get saved, teach them, and help them to grow so they can reach others. That's how eventually you got saved. And God's waiting for you and wants to use you to fulfill the assignment he has for you. What is your assignment? Let's fulfill it. If you've never received Christ today, receive him. Ask him to save you. Let's bow for prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done for us. Thank you for loving us so much that you were willing to die so we could have eternal life. I pray if there's someone here that's not saved, that before they leave here, they'll put their faith and trust in you. And God, they'll leave here knowing for sure they're going to heaven. desire is for you to experience liberty in your own life through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that we're all sinners and because of our sin there's nothing we can do that will ever merit favor with God. But that's why Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, died on a cross to pay for our sins. He was buried and three days later he rose again from the dead proving that everything he said was true. We can put our faith in him. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior today, I encourage you to call upon Him. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can do that today by praying a simple prayer just like this one. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that the Bible is true. I believe you are God. I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that because of my sin, I deserve hell. Jesus, you died for me. You were buried and you rose again from the dead, proving that you were God. And right now, in the best way I know how, I ask you to save me. Please forgive me of my sin and take me to heaven when I die. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Help me to live for you. If you just prayed that prayer, we celebrate your new relationship with Jesus Christ. We'd love to be an encouragement to you in any way. Just contact us through our website. You can like us on Facebook to find updates about this ministry or follow us on Twitter. We are so thankful that you joined us today at Experience Liberty.